Texas. We feel like it's a great step forward for the breed compared to what we've been using since about 2014, so the last six or so years. Not that those indexes didn't serve a good purpose and not that they weren't useful, but we are extremely excited that we have taken a big step forward in the really what these indexes will bring the breed in terms of multi-trait improvement. And like Ryan said, I wanna thank Dr. Jason Archer and the staff and his team at Abacus Bio in New Zealand. They're great to work with. They're the most experienced index builders in the world. And of course, Ryan has his fingerprints on this too. And so it was a great process. It's actually a process that's been going on now for over a year. And so we're excited that next Tuesday we'll go live in terms of these indexes will be completely available across the breed and online and so forth. And so it is kind of a, again, a red letter, very exciting day. We're glad to bring you these indexes and thanks to Dr. Archer and also to Ryan for all their hard work. So welcome tonight and I hope you enjoy and get a lot out of the presentation. Thanks. Well, thank you, Tom. And uh, with that, we'll kind of go ahead and, and get started today. And again, appreciate Dr. Archer for, for joining us. And so, um, you know, as we, as we think about, you know, selection indexes or, or different things, you know, what is a selection index? I think, you know, to get everyone started on the right foot, it's probably good to review some of these topics. And so, you know, really what a, a selection index is, is just a weighting of an animal's EPD profile to predict which animals will be more uh, profitable as a parent. And so, you know, me being a geneticist, I think it's absolutely impossible for me to give some sort of presentation without an equation here. So I'm just gonna knock it out right here in the first slide. I think from here on, we should be fairly equation free. But, you know, as we look at, at what necessarily an index looks like, you know, really it's just this index value here is just the combination of an economic weight times a specific EPD. And this is just, all the way out to the number of EPDs that we have in that index, and then their associated economic weights. And so as we talk about what we're doing or, or what we're trying to accomplish or what we've worked on over the past year, really what we've been doing is, is looking at updating the models or, or maybe the equations that we're applying to within these indexes to these specific EPDs. And so, Kind of what we'll go through tonight is is some of that process and then and then the results of that and so just kind of wanted to start off with a with a brief overview of of what a selection index is so kind of you know tom had, had mentioned some of the history of of red angus in terms of selection index and and like he had mentioned you know red angus first introduced uh, breed-wide generalized indexes in, in 2014. At that time, uh, two indexes were released, one being the Herd Builder Index, which is an all-purpose index that covered traits from conception to harvest, as well as Gridmaster, which was a more of a terminal index that covered traits from weaning until harvest. And so here on the right side of the screen, I've got uh, what's known as an importance graph, and, and I'll use these several times throughout the presentation of, and essentially what these are is just a, a visual representation within the index of what emphasis or, or what weight um, a resulting index value would be accounted for by different EPDs. And so as we, as we look at, at the previous herd builder index, we see that a, a large amount of that importance value was, was occupied by stability, average daily gain, heifer pregnancy, and calving ease. So this kind of gives you a snapshot of, of what that herd builder index looked like that we've kind of been using from 2014. As we look at, at Gridmaster, again, because it's kind of the traits from weaning until harvest, a, a few less traits incorporated in that index, 
largely driven by the average daily gain EPD, DMI, marbling, and, and retail cuts having, having an influence over that resulting index value as well. So this kind of serves as, as maybe a basis of, of what we're look or what it looks like in terms of you know what importance some of those previous indexes were putting on specific traits. So, you know, we we have these these indexes that we've been using from since 2014, and and I think like Tom had said, you know, they've served us well and uh, have allowed us to really, you know, try to achieve some of the goals that we have in in terms of making genetic progress in in a multitude of traits. And so, you know, some may question why why would we want to update these selection indexes? What what would cause us to you know want to make these changes every time we make a change in a genetic evaluation you know that that causes re-ranking maybe cause some angst among the membership you know why would we be looking at at doing some of these things and and to me i you know as i was making this i i thought for a long time about you know what what were maybe some big bucket items that that we were looking at at trying to achieve with these updated selection index. And so these, these here are kind of, I guess, my four big bucket items of, of things that I thought, you know, really were looking to improve in terms of these updated selection index. The first being, you know, updated pricing information. So when those indexes were first introduced in 2014, they were using a, a 10 year rolling average. And so that, that rep the prices, the economic inputs used in that index, you know, represented prices from 2004 to 2014. And so, you know, a lot has changed in terms of the way grids are, are structured, maybe different prices in terms of lean calves, things of that nature, feed costs have also changed. And so, you know, having more updated economic inputs for the index is definitely you know an advantage that we see to kind of give more of a a look at at what those those current prices are and and apply those within our selection decisions another really important thing that that i think you know is a is a big factor for me is you know we with this index update process we were also being able to to implement updated and improved models uh, for these economic factors. And so, you know, Jason will go into a, a bit more detail on this here, here in a minute, but, you know, for some of these traits, are, I guess in our previous index, we were using linear coefficients for all traits. And so essentially what we would be saying there is across the EPD distribution, we're getting equal economic gain and and for some traits we know that that's not the case you know jason will cover some of those topics here in a minute but you know we wanted to incorporate that information or that type of modeling into these indexes and really give people a, a better view of of some of those some of those economic responses Another thing that that's maybe more uh, an advantage for me is is you know with the way that these indexes are designed is there's a lot more flexibility built into them and so you know for example in the future if we add an additional trait to our EPD suite that we want to include into this index you know we get we have a a, a pretty good advantage of of being able to incorporate that into our uh epd or into our indexes very easily and efficiently and so i think that's definitely an advantage going forward is that we we definitely see you know future merit down the road of being able to add or maybe even subtract traits from our indexes if if we see fit fit and kind of the last thing is you know with these updated indexes you know we've added a, a bit more granularity um, on the economic impact maybe different epd profiles could have to, on different phases of, of beef production and so we'll we'll talk here you know about these different indexes um, a little bit later but you know really we've kind of divided those up kind of at natural break points within the beef supply chain here in the US. And so, you know, not only can you see what that animal's uh, EPD profile could maybe do in terms of profitability across all segments, but as well as within, you know, sub segments as well. And so I think that, 
you know, adding some of that granularity and allowing people to see that, you know, gives them the opportunity to, to look for those bulls that maybe better fit their, their breeding objectives. And so for this next section here, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Jason and he's going to go through maybe some of the process uh, that we went to or went through kind of over the last year in terms of, of these index updates. So Jason, you should have control of the screen now. Thanks, Ron. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope you can translate a combination of New Zealand and Australian accent into, uh, into your local language. It's um, lunchtime here on Friday in, in New Zealand. So um, I hope you all had a good day. And so I'll talk a little bit just about the process and maybe the nuts and bolts. And one of the things that, um, that we like to do when we're creating indexes is get a really good feel for, um, I guess, what the membership of the Red Angus Association um, believe about indexes and how they think they're going to use them and uh, what sort of priorities they feel that they put on traits. Now, that's not to say that we um, go, we develop these indexes based on people's opinion. We don't, we base them on, on economics um, and the hard economics, but it's, it's still useful to know what, what people are generally thinking because I think the, uh, the better these indexes um, both reflect the economics, but also um, if, if they can agree with what people are thinking, then uh, people are more likely to use them. And, and I think Ryan will show something towards the end uh, in terms of uh, how these indexes align with what, with what you all have been doing in terms of your uh, selection decisions over the last um, 10 years or so. So we actually started with, um, with a survey. Many of you might have seen this and, and remember it. Um, but we, we released an online survey um, with the aim of understanding what, what people's thoughts were, why they use Red Angus, um, is there, you know, what sort of indexes would they like to see? Um, Ryan has already talked about the breakdown of the indexes in terms of giving um, an insight into different segments of the, of the, um, of the production system, for example. Uh, what traits do they prioritise and and actually are the differences between people who breed Red Angus bulls and their commercial customers in terms of what, what their view of the of breeding is. So we did the survey and we got a, a bunch of responses and that little pie chart there just shows where those responses came from. So, you know, close to a half of the respondents were, were Red Angus breeders and then probably the other almost a half or slightly over a half were either commercial people uh, using Red Angus in their breeding program or breeders who also had commercial herds. So had that, some of that commercial perspective as well. And, and, and of course, then there were a few um, growers or feedlotters um, who also responded and gave us their opinion. So we asked a bunch of questions and, and I'm not gonna go through all the questions, but one thing that we do do in the survey uh, is we use a, a technique that's taken from economics and we ask people to, to rate trade-offs and, and they would make in terms of one trait versus the other. And we can put that together and um, create a, a list of trait priorities in terms of what people are saying. So this next slide, if I can just advance it, um, actually gives us um, an insight as to, um, as to what people were thinking. So I'll just explain this a little bit. So we've got some traits that we asked to people to prioritize along the bottom. And um, in this case, a low number is a high priority. So uh, a trait um, with its, its box or its mean um, distribution towards the, the bottom is, is a higher priority trait. And you can see um, faintly those gray dots, which are actually all the individual responses. So that gives you an idea of the actual distribution of what people are saying. And, um, and, and this is reason, we've done this with other, with other breed associations um, in the US and in Canada, and, and we tend to get largely similar results, uh, perhaps not surprisingly. Uh, but one of the, well, probably the most um, highly prioritized traits um, is actually stability. And, 
and then heifer pregnancy, which I guess is the, the fertility trait um, of heifers, but also presumably related somewhat to, to stability as well. So um, a lot of the, the high priority tends to go on the functional female traits. And then as we move down there, we sort of see the growth traits, um, yearling weight, marbling, are probably medium priority. And interestingly for, for us, I guess, particularly from our perspective here in New Zealand, is, is um, actually people put less emphasis um, on mature cow weight when they answer these questions, although there is obviously a large degree of variation and, and there are people that put a lot of emphasis on it and, and people that put, put somewhat less emphasis on it. Um, I say it's interesting from our perspective because I guess our breeders um, tend to put a lot of emphasis on keeping mature cow weight down, as, as I know do, do some breeders um, in, in the US. So, so that's the, the survey. So I'm just trying to advance to the next slide. I just want to cover a little bit about the nuts and bolts of how we produce um, these indexes or what really goes, goes into them. And um, this is sort of the overview slide. So for each trait, um, there's a few things that we need to account for. So the one that probably gets all the intention, attention is what's the economic value of, of the trait? In other words, how much money does it make? And we need to ask that question in the context of a commercial herd, so, um, so your customer, um, rather than in a herd that's breeding bulls. So what, what, how much difference does an extra percentage of, of unit of marbling or um, pound of mature weight or pound of growth or unit of calving ease, what economic difference does that make to the average commercial operation? So that's one of the pieces of the information that we need. But we also need to know how many times we actually get to express that trait. Um, and both in the sire's direct descendants, um, their progeny, but also their progeny's progeny and, and even their progeny's progeny progeny over, um, and we use a 20 year time horizon for that. And, and I'll, I'll go through that a little bit more in the next slide. And then we also account for essentially the time value of money. So what's the delay from selecting that bull through to um, expressing that trait? Because some of these traits are being expressed over a long period of time. And so we, uh, standard economic theory, you would, you would account for the time, the time value of money in doing so. So the structure that we um, have used is essentially the assumptions are we've got 100 calves born over a size lifetime in, in, in rough terms. And so that actually sets the units of these indexes, which I think Ryan will talk about. Um, but the, you know, per calf born rather than per cow joined. Um, there's not a lot of difference between the two, but, um, but there is some difference. And so in this situation, we've got a sire and he's got 100 calves born and his genetics are going to disseminate through a self-replacing herd, but we're also allowing for some of those daughters of his um, to then maybe go out to um, another herd that might be using um, a terminal sire. And so what actually that means is that we are accounting for keeping more daughters in, into a maternal replacement scenario than you might do just if you were only producing a self-replacing herd. And that's accounting for um, the role that Red Angus plays in, in your industry in terms of um, forming part of um, being a strong maternal breed and forming part of the maternal, maternal base um, in, in some herds that may be using some terminal size. And, and the effect of that actually is because we've got more animals um, being modelled as going as having some maternal influence, it just upweights the, uh, the emphasis that we place on maternal traits a little bit. And of course, um, the non-replacement calves in this model um, all enter the, the beef production system, so the feedlot and, and slaughter systems, and so express those traits. This slide just um, gives a bit of a, a pictorial representation of what I've just been talking about, um, but it only focuses on the actual direct descendants of the sire. So you imagine you've got a trait like um, uh, feedlot, growth in the feedlot, for example. Well, that trait, the, the sire has 100 calves born. Um, that trait is expressed in 
50 of um, the steer progeny of that sire and also some of the female, female progeny. So these female progeny come down here and then um, some of them are not retained as replacements. Um, they, they are fed and slaughtered as well. So, so that trait would be expressed in those animals. Of course, some of his females are retained as replacements um, and either in a, in a self-replacing herd or as I talked about before in a terminal herd. And then these replacements um, stay in the herd for hopefully 10 years. Um, and every year they express some other traits. So they, um, they express a fertility trait in terms of whether they get in calf. Uh, they express um, a maternal calving ease trait. Um, and, and they eat feed, so um, which we predict from a mature cow weight um, type of trait. And then at the end of that period, um, they're culled as a cow, hopefully, um, and, um, and they express a, a, cull, a residual cull value as, as a cow that's slaughtered. So it's actually more, even more complex than that because this female might, at two years of age, she has her first calf, and then at three years, she has her second calf, and then some of those calves, of course, will be steers, and they'll, they'll express um, slaughter traits like feedlot growth and, and marbling and, and, and so on. And so, of course, these traits get expressed over time as well. And then these females might also have daughters that, that express um, half of their genes as well. So. Our, what we call our discounted genetic expressions, which is a technical term for, for this, this part of the model, um, builds up and accounts for all those expressions over time. So that is down in the weeds a little bit, but just to give you a little bit of an idea of, of the sort of factors that go into this, as well as just the economics. So I'll now talk just briefly about um, the economics without getting into a lot of detail on any one trait. Um, we can ask questions about that later if you like. Um, so the question that we ask for modeling trade economics is what's the economic impact of one unit change in each particular trait if everything else remains the same? So we might say what's the economic impact of um, a cow being a, a pound heavier or a pound lighter given that nothing else might change? And so we put values on that and we um, in the case of mature weight of, of, the, of the cow, um, we know that that cow, if she's a pound heavier, she, she will eat just a little bit more um, every year and express that every year. Um, she'll be a pound heavier when we slaughter her, um, so we'll get slightly more cow value for her. Um, but also we've got to grow her as a replacement and put an extra pound on her to do that. So she's going to eat a little bit more as a replacement as well. So, so that's the, the type of modeling that we do. And as I mentioned before, we do that um, based on a commercial um, production system rather than a bull breeding herd. So we gathered to do this, we, we get quite a sophisticated model. Um, the spreadsheet that we've got this model in is, is a pretty large spreadsheet. Um, and we get a, a bunch of inputs, um, which might be things like reproductive rates, herd survival parameters, um, cow survival parameters, um, a whole lot of information from a, a bunch of different sources. But particularly the economic information um, we get from USDA and, and cattle facts, um, particularly. And, and there's a list of perhaps what are the more um, sensitive prices um, or, or important inputs in terms of prices, price inputs um, down the right hand side. And so what we've done in this situation, we've um, gone to these data sources and we've, we've got data sources that we um, believe that we're gonna be able to, to go back to and, and repeat. And we've used, um, I think in this case, a five year rolling average. So we've used data from, um, from 2015 to 19, I think it is, uh, and and got the average, um, for example, yield grade premiums or um, or uh, quality grade premiums um, over that period, and the intent, I believe, that, that Tom and Ryan have is is to actually upgrade, uh, change that rolling average every year. So every year, these prices might change, might change. 
um, slightly, and the, therefore the index will change a little bit, um, but it will be a, a very subtle and, and reasonably um, minor change um, on a year, which, which is, in my view, a better approach than leaving everything constant and then getting to the point where 10 years down the track, five or 10 years down the track, you've actually got to make some, some really major changes. And so Ryan mentioned a little bit um, earlier about um, what we do in terms of incorporating non-linear non -linear economic weights in these models. And we believe that this is um, actually a really important thing to do. And it's, it's something that um, reflects the real world a lot better um, than traditionally. Um, the theory always used to be that you only use linear models. Um, but we believe that actually reflecting reality with some non-linear models um, is actually really important. And we find that it, um, the indexes tend to make more sense to people when we use these for particular traits. So the traits that we've used um, a non-linear approach for, and I'll talk about a couple of examples just to, to give you an idea, um, are carving ease, um, milk, um, carcass weights, um, and then the traits associated with grading, so um, marbling for the quality grade and, and fat, fat and ribeye area for, um, for the yield grade. And here's what we do with a carving ease example. So we actually took this data from the Red Angus um, database. And so this graph on the left hand side here, and, and I apologize, the, the writing's a little bit small to see, but it's actually plotting the actual real incidence observed of, um, of carving ease against, um, and these are for, for reasonably accurate size with a reasonable number of observations. Um, so what's the, what is the actual observed carving ease that we've got on these sires against their EPDs? And um, because there's a lot of data in, in, in this area down here, it gets a bit cluttered, but you can, you can see when we fit a curve to that, that curve's not a straight line. Um, and so what it's saying is that um, the incidence of carving ease um, drops substantially till you get to, to a certain level. And then once you get to a, a bull EPD carving ease, and, and there's no scale there, but you know, let's say it's, it's five or, or wherever that is, um, the actual impact of improving carving ease further uh, there's still an impact, but it's a lot less than, than what it would be if we're going, say, from a, a poor carving ease bull, or, you know, to take an extreme, you know, a, a minus 15 to a, to a minus 10, for example. And so the economics actually reflects in this curve on the right-hand side. So again, the value of going from uh, minus 15 to, to minus 10, which is in this part of the curve that I've got my cursor on, is quite steep. We get a pretty significant economic response from that. Whereas if we're up the other end of the curve and we're going from 10 to 15, well, at 10, we're hardly getting, um, we're not getting a lot of um, dystopia in the herd. Um, and so improving the carving ease more still has value, but that value is, is, um, is a lot less than, than the value down here. And so using this nonlinear approach, what this tends to do um, is knock the bad bulls out of the top of the index. Um, so, so those really poor carving these bulls, um, they will really struggle to make it anywhere near the top of the index. Um, but it doesn't reward the excessively high carving these bulls to, to a ridiculous extent. So if, if you kept on rewarding those bulls um, with the same economic value as what we have down here, what we'd find is the index becomes dominated by um, small bulls that that, um, that have high carving ease, but, but don't have um, some of the other attributes that we want. So, so that's a real key feature um, that we build into these indexes. So that's one example of a reason to use a nonlinear um, approach. Um, the other example that we've got here is, okay, what happens um, when we have a distribution? Um, and this is particularly with the, the quality grades and the same thing um, applies to the yield grades. So, to use marbling and, and a quality grade as an example, we've got a distribution of animals and let's say um, it's the base animal here and, and the base sire here in, in the blue curve um, has a distribution of, of outcomes from his, 
you know, say you had a hundred or a thousand um, steer progeny, um, obviously he's not going to have a thousand in real life, but from the distribution point of view, um, so he's going to have um, a number in, in standard and select, and then hopefully a, a much larger number in, in upper two thirds choice and, and hopefully some prime. Now, if we improve the marbling and if we take another bull and, and improve the marbling, we're going to shift that distribution and, and therefore we might get the distribution that's under this, um, I guess it's a brown curve. Um, and by doing so, we're actually going to change significantly the proportion of animals that make it into um, upper two thirds choice and prime. But because we're talking about a curve and we're moving a curve through a straight line, um, that actually is not linear. Um, and, and we get a, a, a shape distribution, which means that, um, that at the very extreme left-hand side, um, we make some difference. And then the, the, the economic impact of improving marbling um, is quite large until you know in theory if we if we were um if every animal sat out in the prime area which obviously doesn't happen but um to take the extreme as the example if every animal sat out in the prime area and and we improve marbling any further then there'd be no no additional value created um, because they're all grading prime and getting the same price anyway so that produces a non-linear outcome um and, and this happens in the real world obviously so by modeling uh this in our indexes uh, we do a better job of representing reality. And, and we do this, as I said, for, for the quality grade, but also for the yield grade traits. Um, the same principles apply moving from yield grade um, five through to one with, with some of those traits. So that's um, a little bit of an outline about the, the economic um, behind, behind the model. Um, there's obviously a lot more detail. Uh, I'll pass it back to you now, Ryan, and. Um, and let you carry on. Well, thank you, Jason, and uh, thank you for, for covering some of that background. And, you know, probably now that we've kind of gone through, you know, maybe some of the ways we modeled the traits and, and uh, you know, some of the advantages that they see that, you know, we see with some of those, I think, you know, a lot of people would be really interested in, you know, what are the updated indexes and, and maybe what do those look like in in terms of what emphasis we're going to put on each trait and so now i'm i'm going to go through uh each of these updated indexes and and kind of talk about a, a little bit of those in depth and then maybe um you know we'll have some comparisons there at the end and so the first index that i'll go through here uh, will be the updated herd builder index and so what this index is is essentially in a maternal index is a maternal index that encompasses traits from conception through weaning. And so this is a, a bit of a shift from what I said earlier in terms of herd builder, where that was a, a, an index that encompassed traits from conception all the way um, through harvest. So that, that's something that we're gonna really wanna keep in mind is that the updated herd builder index does have a, a different um, definition in terms of the traits that that it's looking at and so you know again within this model kind of similarly to how Jason had described earlier heifers will be retained in the herd and we can look at you know maybe this is a an index where where animals would be marketed at weaning and so as we look at at, at our importance graph here in terms of what emphasis this updated index will put on different traits we see that you know stability has a large emphasis on on the resulting index values and so you know this makes sense we've heard for a long time here in the US that that longevity and and fertility is is really important in terms of cow calf production and that's exactly what we saw in terms of of formulating this index kind of through the cow calf phase Additionally, you know, heifer pregnancy has a considerable impact. Cavities maternal and mature weight are kind of all similar in terms of their impact. Weaning weight, cavities direct kind of is our next tier in terms of importance. And then milk is a little bit lower in terms of our importance. 
the, the next index here will be our grid master index. And, and really what the grid master index is looking at is, is looking at profitability difference from the non-retained animals through kind of the feedlot and harvest phase of production. And so as we look at that, at, at some of the importance and some of the traits incorporated in that, we see that average daily gain, carcass weight, marbling have, you know, pretty large impact on those resulting values. Uh, DMI also has a, a fairly considerable impact in terms of the resulting index values, and then ribeye and back fat are a little bit lower uh, in terms of the, the impact that they have on, on the resulting index values. Then we're gonna have a new and updated all-purpose index. And so our new all-purpose index or our index that'll cover traits from conception to harvest will be known as the Profitability and Sustainability Index, which will have the acronym PROS as you see here on the screen. And so really what this index does is it's a combination of the breeding of objectives or, or that we see in herd builder and grid master. And so as we think of a, a pro S value of an animal, it's just simply the, the addition of herd builder and grid master. And the reason that we can do that is because all of these indexes are expressed in terms of dollars per calf born. And so our math becomes really easy in terms of identifying, you know, this, this combination here. And so, you know, kind of as we think about using these, we, you know, we'll see bulls that result in high pro S values that are really high in grid master, but maybe a little lower in, all right, excuse me, in grid master, a little lower in herd builder or vice versa, they can be, you know, kind of high in both. And so that's, that's where we see maybe a bit more of that, that granularity, um, you know, having these two kind of sub indexes as, as a result of, of pro S. Again, as we look here in, in terms of the importance values of, of some of these different EPDs uh, included in the index, you know, one of the big advantages to me and, and one of the things I think is, is really good about our updated pro in our updated pro S index is that we see that we have a lot of traits contributing, um, you know, a, a, having a considerable contribution to that resulting pro S index value. We don't see, you know, still within this pro S stability is still our highest contributor, but we have other traits, you know, still considerably contributing to that resulting pro S index value. And so, you know, as we think about that, the, the advantage to this type of thing is generally those bulls or, or females that are going to be high in that pro end pro S index are going to be ones with really, you know, balanced EPD profiles, generally they're going to be bull you know bulls or females that that are going to improve us in, or improve our genetics on on a lot of different fronts and so this again just kind of gives us a, a breakdown of of maybe what the relative emphasis of the, of each of the traits are within that resulting index but we do see that that a lot of these traits are are contributing to those resulting index values so, you know, we've kind of gone through now what the, the new indexes look like in, in terms of, you know, importance, what maybe what relative emphasis they're going to put on different traits. But, you know, I think an important thing to do is, is maybe do a, a little bit of comparison to our previous indexes to see, um, you know, maybe some differences there maybe help to to understand as you're looking within your own herds of if an animal maybe re-ranks one way or another, maybe what what some possible causes for, for some of that re-ranking may be. So probably one of the biggest differences that, that we see in terms of, of comparing our pro S to our old all-purpose, which would be herd builder, is the amount of emphasis that we're putting on traits from conception to weaning and then post weaning to harvest. So in our previous index, we were seeing that about 72% of the emphasis within that index were being put on those traits from conception to weaning. About 30% were put on those post harvest traits. 
whereas now we're seeing a, a much more even kind of 50 50 split between those traits uh you know that occur pre-weaning as well as post-weaning the next graph here um, is a uh, what we call a, a response to selection graph and so within this graph uh, the x-axis here kind of represents all the different EPDs that are contained within the index and then the y-axis here is is kind of the difference in those EPD values and so within this graph the the dark blue bar here represents our previous herd builder the orange bar here represents our previous grid master the gray bar represents the updated herd builder yellow bar represents the updated grid master and the blue kind of light blue bar here represents our pro s index and so this kind of you know what this graph shows or the the aim of this graph is to say you know what do we expect the average change in our epd profile to look like given we've made one standard deviation of improvement in within each one of these individual indexes and so kind of as we look at that for for some of the updated indexes as we look at herd builder we see we're putting you know increases on stability cavities maternal heifer pregnancy we're also putting a down weight on maintenance energy and a mature weight or a metabolic mature weight here and so you know we're really trying to boost those maternal traits within this index and you kind of see that within our importance graph as we look at some of our response to selection for our grid master index it's it's probably no surprise that within that we're trying to increase growth as well as some of our carcass traits we're getting increases in marbling carcass weight as well as kind of trying to keep increases in ribeye area as well and so as we think about you know kind of those two objectives we we see here oftentimes the the blue bar is intermediate of that and so we're kind of getting within the pro index pro s index a combination of, of those two results so we're you know with if we look across pro s we're making uh increases in terms of heifer pregnancy stability calving ease maternal while also increasing our, our early in life growth rates and increasing our carcass traits as well so you know within that pro s index we wouldn't maybe necessarily get quite as much response as selecting on one of the sub indexes but we do get a better response across more traits in a more desirable direction. And so that's you know, something really important to keep in mind as, as we're talking to, or you know, maybe making decisions ourselves or, or recommending different you know, bulls to, to customers of, of some of these responses to that to selection. The other thing that uh, we kind of put together is you know a, a little analysis of of looking at you know do these updated indexes you know kind of better align with with what you guys are doing in, in terms of red angus breeders and so you know kind of jason had covered how we had um, conducted a survey last fall um, to get some kind of input from from breeders and and commercial cattlemen but you know i kind of wanted to look at at maybe an analysis that that looked at you know do these these indexes align better and so essentially what i did here is i just took uh the genetic trends for each of the indexes um from 2009 to 2019 and calculated a, a slope for each of those indexes i then um divided that by the standard deviation of each index to kind of get you know a more linear line essentially of how how much progress we we were making with these selection decisions in in each of these indexes and so as we look at our gray line here this would have represented our pro s index had we used that or our in our orange line here represents our herd builder index and so as we as we look here you know we see a considerably steeper slope in terms of our pro s index over this time frame versus what we see with our our previous herd builder index and so you know to me what that signifies is that we're we're 
you know, these indexes kind of better align with those decisions that you guys are making as breeders in terms of, of emphasis that you're putting on, on different traits that, that uh, influence the resulting index. Another important thing I think to look at here is, you know, kind of one thing that, that we talk about in terms of, you know, index selection or, or making genetic progress is, you know, the amount of time that we would that it would take to make one standard deviation of improvement within these indexes. And so if we look at our, our Pro S index kind of using 2009 as our base year, if we continued essentially on the same trajectory of, of progress as we did, you know, the last 10 years going forward, about 2021, we would have, you know, made one standard deviation of improvement within those indexes. So a little over, you know, 11 years to make that one standard deviation of improvement. Whereas if we look at the herd builder index, our previous herd builder index, it would have taken us, if we continued on the same trajectory in terms of, of improvement of that index, we, we would have hit one standard deviation of improvement as a breed in 2043. And so considerably longer time frame to hit that one kind of one standard deviation of improvement benchmark. Now, if we compare that to what we would make continuing on our same trajectory for Pro S in that same time frame to one, make one standard deviation of improvement in herd builder, we would have been we if we continue to to go on that same trajectory we would make about three standard deviations of improvement in pro S. And so I think, you know, to me, what that really signifies is, is these updated indexes, you know, pro, do, a, do a better job of matching kind of the decisions that you guys are making as breeders um, in terms of, of traits that you're prioritizing to make genetic improvement in. So kind of as we're, we're getting close to, to wrapping up here, I just wanted to kind of quickly go through some, some quick, quick takeaways, maybe a, a bit of review here. And then after this, we'll, we'll open it up from questions. And so, you know, the biggest thing here is we are moving from publishing two indexes to three. So we will publish the Pro S index that will be the all purpose index from conception to harvest the herd builder index that will be an, a sub index of pro s that'll go from conception to weaning and then the grid master index that will be kind of the post weaning to harvest traits i think it's really important for us to remember that you know herd builder has changed its definition you know previously it did it was did contain some post weaning traits but now we'll only be kind of through weaning. So I think that's something that we'll have to do a good job of, of remembering that, that those post weaning traits are, are taken out of that index. Again, you know, Pro S, our updated all purpose index, we'll see a larger influence of traits that, that occur after weaning. So our post weaning and carcass traits, we'll see those, those EPDs having a larger influence over those resulting index value. Another thing that we'll see is, and, and something that, you know, maybe the previous grid master index, uh, you know, maybe a criticism of that was the, the spread in terms of that index. I think kind of across the 500 most used sires, you know, that spread was about, uh, you know, $2 per exposure. Whereas now with the updated grid master index, we'll see a lot larger spread in terms of those resulting index values which is probably a, a better true reflection in terms of the difference of those animals um, in terms of post weaning to harvest profitability. Another thing that we will see is a shift in the mean values of the indexes. And so what that means is, you know, the percentile ranks of those indexes won't be the same as what they previously were or the average value of those indexes uh, will be a bit different. 
um, kind of, you know, this is a bit rough, but kind of what I've looking at the percentiles, you know, generally about the means, about a value of 115 for Pro S, about an 80 for herd builder and about a 40 for grid master. So that's kind of, you know, it deviates a little bit off of that, but that's kind of the, the general values that we see across the, you know, the active sire, the active dam, and then the non-parent group in terms of kind of maybe where some of those average values lie. The next thing is, is that these indexes are expressed as dollars per calf born instead of dollars per exposure. And I think, you know, that's probably in, in terms of as we talk about these different index values, I think that's to me probably a more intuitive measure or more intuitive way of, of looking at things. And then, you know, kind of the final thing here is that we will, you know, be updating these parameters the economic input parameters for the indexes, you know, will be updated annually with kind of those five year rolling averages. And so that'll allow us to do a better job in terms of, you know, kind of mirroring the market a bit better versus waiting, you know, a certain number of years and, and updating those all at once. And so with that, um, I'm happy to, to, open it up for for any questions 